We are continuing our program in the context of, of uh, performativity. This is the lecture before the last one. We have an event today. Our guest is an outstanding cultural theorist, a thinker, Diedrich Dietrichsen, with his paper on the institutional strategies under globalization of culture. First, I will introduce Dietrich, though he doesn't need any introduction, and then I'll say a few words about the context of our meeting today. Dietrich Dietrichsen is a professor of the Vienna Academy of Arts. He's a theoretician who devoted his text to music, theater. He authored many books and articles, works on the economy of artistic production, on the theory, theory of art, theory of music. Uh, among his books are uh, Utopia of Sound, a book that uh, with Anselm Frank, and he also curated many uh, cultural and, now I switch uh, to English exhibition and exhibition projects. more convenient to uh, somehow have one and the same language. Uh, today we are discussing the, the urgent problem of this clash and uh, controversy and contradiction between the global and local conditions and we know to what extent it became important with the recent events uh, with Brexit, with US elections, with Georgian elections, with Russian elections, with the previous situation in Brexit and where not. Uh, we are witnessing um, localization and nationalization of cultural politics, of economy, um, and shrinking of the space for international policies and um, critical thought and critical theory which ever claimed uh, the values of transnational global interchange. Um, but nevertheless, in many cases uh, that we all experienced with Brexit, with uh, Trump elections, not Trump elections, but U.S. elections, yeah. which brought us Trump. <laughs> it's a very weird slip of the tongue. Uh, uh, um, but very important case uh, that uh, epitomizes this um, node of problems and very painful node of problems is the debate uh, around uh, Berlin theater Volksbühne, where the art context, which is a global, transnational context and the theatrical context, which is national, um, leftist, socialist um, context, clashed uh, to define uh, which of the contexts and which of the narratives had been progressive. Um, and um, we had been um, witnessing a very, very painful situation when um, left critical thought, leftist critical thought that had ever been maintaining the um, globally oriented condition somehow became um, blamed and accused um, uh, and became the proponent of financial capital, of neoliberalism, of elitism for its uh, anti-localist um, politics uh, whereas the, uh, exactly those class for which the uh, leftist theory stands, the working class, was cast away uh, in the context of uh, local economy, national economy, uh, xenophobic statements, um, and uh, local and locally oriented cultural politics. And this seems to be, uh, at the moment, an irresolvable impasse uh, which com completely confused where is left, where is right, uh, and I think the art context that had a clear-cut uh, directions about it before all these events is totally confused at the moment, and I think that um, today's uh, paper by Diedrich 
maybe has some points which could clarify this impasse. Thank you, Diedrich, for being with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Katie. <clears throat> Thank you very much for, for having me here uh, again, and also uh, for this introduction, which uh, already yeah, um, set the, the territory quite, uh, quite fittingly. Um, I've changed the title of the talk several times. It is now called Enlightened English-Speaking Anti-Homophobic Anti-Sexist and Anti-Racist but unfortunately Neoliberal Globalism versus Localist Provincial Quasi-Socialist and unfortunately Nationalist Anger. The title of my talk refers to the international constellation that Katie has already outlined, which currently seems to transgress the old left-right divide. Erdogan, Orban, Le Pen, Gerd Wilders, the German AFD, the Austrian FPÖ, Putin, Trump, Duterte, South American evangelical populists, African ultra-homophobic traditionalists, are all on the rise, and they all play the game of siding with the so-called working class and an imaginary type of the people against a homosexual, English-speaking, art-loving, international so-called elite and also against the global refugees, which this elite is oh, is called to be supporting against real citizens, which in most cases are white in terms of a light skin color as well as conceptually white. The basic assumption of this game that the left-right divide should be replaced with the nation of simple people against a decadent internationalist elite is not entirely new. It reminds one of fascist ideological scenarios of the first half of the 20th century. And above all, in general, always one rule applies. Whenever someone claims that the left-right divide has disappeared, one should be skeptic. This has always been a claim of a certain part of that divide, namely the right old classic slogan of the right, that there is no more left and right. But until recently, although the success story of the global nationalist right could not be denied, this tendency had no chance to arrive inside the enlightened discourse of leftist, internationalist, and especially anti-essentialist thinking. But things have changed. I will talk today about a seemingly minor cultural conflict in Germany. A conflict of luxury, one could say. It is not about taking money away from the advanced arts. On the contrary, it is a good old debate about cultural and ideological directions and orientations. But it comes with an inner logic which resembles the global developments in politics I have spoken about before. I will talk tonight about this cultural conflict in two ways. First, its specific format in an ongoing battle about symbolic and artistic territory in contemporary Berlin. The struggle around a theater called Volksbühne, literally the people's stage, and its new appointed director, the art curator Chris Durkin, currently at Tate Modern in London. Second, its relation to past, present, and future of the political categories left and right, especially in cultural wars, but also in general. The erosion of a cultural left, I will show, that is fairly and unfairly under attack everywhere for being responsible for not preventing us from the current wave of a returning authoritarianism 
almost all over the world. I will begin with a little ethnography, a little historical ethnography of Berlin in the last 25 years. After the wall came down, the new whole Berlin, and especially the former East, became an urban playground of all kinds of subcultures, Eastern and Western. This is also an urban legend, but it's also true. The old Western subcultures of punk, politically radical anarchists, diverse types of artists, bohemians, mixed with old East German bohemians, plus the new international subculture of techno. This highly diverse scene, not only in tastes and preferences, but also reaching from proletarian macho to queer intellectual, from leftist to nihilist, from feminist electronica enthusiast to sexist rocker, somehow finds its, found its synthesis in two formats, the endless night and the temporary space. Endlessness and temporariness, meaning a temporary, temporarily limited use of vacant buildings, became the aesthetic political frames for collaboration, economical infrastructure, and for a certain stability of the instable. I'm trying to address a crisis in the political understanding of what is currently happening in the aftermath of the giant cultural and the touristic boom that Berlin has been through. It is a situation which in the microclimate of art and culture, and even more so avant-garde art and culture, where success and money are not accepted as currencies of evaluation, is looking at itself in a similarly clueless way as the entire liberal and leftist culture of the West is looking at itself in the wake of a global rise of totalitarianism and authoritarianism, which maybe in this country has already been a, pleasure, a displeasure for a longer period. So the new freedom of 1990, when this cultural cycle began with techno and the use of all kinds of vacant buildings and territories, starts, had these two components, endless nights and temporary buildings. The fun never stopped and the buildings were of no specific importance. Important was only that they would not last, and that this was reflected in their worn-out character as quasi-ruins. Endlessness and temporariness were in a way reversed. What in the real world is stable, architecture, buildings, was temporary and fluid. What normally is fluid and fleeting, the night and the music never stopped. Of course, also this reversal is all but entirely new in the history of Bohemian culture. Drifters and poets, artists and prostitutes, thieves and musicians always turned the night into an endlessness and never stayed longer at one building. But this aspect of their lives was rather a symptom of their fate or decision to live in the shadow of the bourgeois or petty bourgeois society. It was not a goal in itself. In Berlin in the early 90s, this seemed to be the case. The spirit of the decade was so explicitly shaped by these achievements to really not find an end for the party and to permanently change your hiding places in former East German buildings, and nothing else was mentioned. In all other namely content-related issues, so subcultures were far too diverse and different. They couldn't use any fixation by words. They were too diverse not only along the line of former East and former West, but also in political, sexual, and other orientations. To be unified by some common idea was impossible. Common ideas only showed up as parodies of common ideas, as in the famous slogan of the Love Parade, Peace, love, and pancake. I mentioned the Love Parade. It was the official institution of those years, but it had no effect on the content and ideas of what people were thinking the rest of the year. Interestingly, the first institution which developed from the spirit of that epoch, now 25 years ago, 
had the shape of the quasi-antique German institution of the city theater. Both Germanys were very proud of their theatrical tradition. And theater was maybe the only art form which also saw some exchange between East and West. In the 1950s, for example, when the whole West German culture sided with American modernism and the Cold War Western cultural policy, only the theater world begged to differ. Brecht was without doubt, as author as well as director, the leading figure in German language theater, and he resided and worked in the East. And in a time when East German authorities threatened and punished everyone who tried to cross the border to the West, it was no problem for many East German theater directors to work temporarily in the West and return. So there was no other art form in which a so-called reunification should have been as easy as in theater. And at first, everyone was optimistic. The East German Brecht disciple Heiner Müller became the most interviewed voice of that epoch in culture with his disillusioned Brecht-schooled communist sarcasm but also with a skepticism towards the Western leftist agenda of a patchwork of minority, as Lyotard has called it. This was especially important in the new Berlin. Both East and West Berlin were theater cities in a special sense, whereas in the rest of the former West, there was a cultural division of labor at work. Munich had film and TV, Cologne and Düsseldorf the visual arts, Karlsruhe the new media, Frankfurt, the critical intellectual elite, Hamburg, the media, the record industry, and so on. West Berlin had theater. But theater is the opposite of the endless and the placeless, the two components of which the new culture had been made of and which made it attractive, not only for youth from all over Europe, but soon also from the whole world. Theater is the most institutional of all institutions. In many European countries and their major cities, the main theater is located in front of the city government or even the national government or the parliament. Its architecture is in many aspects, aspects a mirror of the assemblies and parliaments which do the legislation. Its notion of a general public is oriented on a notion of public that is politically interested in both senses of the word. It has an investment in public, political discourse, because it sees it in it a device to influence the general course of affairs, a tool to influence what is really going on in politics, and secondly, an interest, as in the word interesting, an almost aesthetic pleasure in debates. In this situation, that is often nostalgically evoked when people complain about the current state of political debates and the culture of a public life, and it is closely connected with the culture of a theater in a city. So it's a very well-established institution, cultural institution, within also the old order. And almost all of the countercultural movements, on the other hand, were moving away from this image of a public exchange in theaters or parliaments in the last half century. They built their own smaller public. They criticized the principle of representation in parliamentarism as well as in theater and preferred and developed instead direct forms of culture from rock music to street theater, from fluxus to happening. Instead of representation, physical presence was considered the goal of cultural activity. From early Christian to Charles Fourier styled anarchism to early stages of Attic democracy. It was all about a direct and often sexual co-presence of and with others, which was also reflected by new genres of art from performance art to noise and improv in more recent decades. In the arrival of techno in the post-war, post-reunification Berlin, it seemed as if this tendency to a self-organized anarchism had not only reached a kind of logical end, parties just could not last longer than forever, 
but also an inclusiveness they never had before, since they were reserved to the participation of those subcultural, subcultural characters who were either courageous and unconventional or rich and educated enough to afford constant partying. Only in certain moments this subcultural logic included the poor, the precarious, and the proletarian population. But this was the case in Berlin. Techno-hedonism became mainstream. It was referred to in cultural diagnoses as a new state of the society. The Love Parade had more than one and a half million participants, and the slogan of the fun society or the raving society appeared in those diagnoses. But this movement was still avoiding meaning and sense in both a traditional political or a traditional bohemian subcultural way. But during the early 90s, something else happened, something that I've already announced it would happen, and that was a new amalgam of this hedonism of endlessness and placelessness with at least one specific theater, the Volksbühne. This theater in the former East, led by an East German director, Frank Kastorf, and with a cast of mainly, but not only, but not only highly capable East German actors, became the ally and also the, so to say, spokesperson or the megaphone of this hedonist culture of the 1990s in Berlin. Two, at first glance, superficial reasons should be mentioned. The Volksbühne under the new direction since the very early 90s was not only young. From the beginning it worked, if that is possible at all, for theater with exactly the two characteristics of this hedonism, extreme long durations and a high mobility. It used all kinds of external venues. It had a rolling, a so-called rolling roadshow which traveled to all parts of Berlin, especially the highly problematic ones. It had productions that lasted much longer than the usual two and a half hours. Six or seven in the first decade were often uh, reached. Later there were even productions which lasted for several days. On top of that, they introduced an ever ongoing and expanding series of related events. Especially the invention of the so-called thematic weekend became something like the formula for a redefinition of the public function of theater in hedonist urban milieu with good education and bad attention deficit disorder. In several rooms there were plenty of simultaneously happening talks, lectures, performances taking place, all about one mostly political theme. Another thing should be mentioned. The placelessness of the hedonism that I mentioned, the placelessness was not absolute. It was not arbitrary where all these short-lived lived venues and bars were situated and located. It was not accidental where people partied all night long. It was important that these ahistorical now people got the reference of history while they were partying in an eternal present tense. History, old walls with bullet holes, formerly East German buildings like a bank, officially East German buildings like a bank or a school. It was indeed a backdrop, a ground to which the hedonism was the figure. NSD construction has showed us the figure ground relation can easily be reverted. The rise of the Volksbühne from the mid 90s onwards had a lot to do with the slow institutionalization of this very constellation by reverting this figure ground logic. The Volksbühne has a history in the socialist tradition of Berlin. It combined the diverse advanced aesthetics of abstraction, hyperactivity, conceptualism, post-Brechtianism of directors like Frank Kastorf, Christoph Schlingensief, René Polesch, Christoph Marthaler, Herbert Fritsch and many others with an ensemble of international and East Germany socialized actors. As in a good socialist um, um, company, the stage workers played an important part. They form a Hans Eisler-inspired choir, 
and also a Neil Young inspired band called Crazy Horst. And they are also now on the forefront of the protest against the threat by the Senate of Berlin to replace long-term director Frank Kastorf, who has been head of the theater much longer than usual in German theaters, with the art curator Chris Derkon. So to summarize, the ahistorical moment of a wordless, timeless subculture which seemed to dream in a positive way what in a negative way was a daily diagnosis of those 90s, post-histoire, end of history. This subculture was made, this state was made into a historical datum, reintroduced into a world of debate, representation, although critical of it, by this theater. It therefore made it also possible to think beyond this moment and still keep it in the sense of Hegelian aufheben, keeping it and transforming it into something new. The positive, to, to keep the positive historical essence of its anti and ahistorical anarchism and hedonism in a now new institution or reformed institution, that would keep this as some historical point of view. Now, there was a relative unanimity in the more recent cultural debates of the city that the magic of the Volksbühne to institutionalize and stabilize and also to define the culturally brilliant situation of the 90s has somewhat faded. Probably in the same velocity by which also Berlin finally had become a target for a new kind of still hedonist and paradoxically individualist mass tourism. Gentrification and real estate speculation followed. But the Volksbühne was still considered a pillar of what was left of oppositional life. Castor's production got slightly redundant and repetitive, repetitive, and everyone seemed to disagree when the previous mayor, Klaus Wolverheit, extended his contract. But when two years ago his successor announced he would replace Kastorf by a world-famous art curator, an outrage broke out. This outrage has many interesting aspects. But I will not go into all of them. For example, one that I will go into, <laughs> being the imperialism of the visual art world. The imperialism of the visual art world in relation to all other art forms in the digital age. Since most reproduction-based art forms do no longer possess a business model, they all tend to travel into the art world with its original-based speculation economy. Only the performance world, or the performing side of a so far reproduction-oriented art form, like music, still promises at least a business model based on access and entrance money. In a parallelization of the inner aesthetic process of an expansion and inclusion of all kinds of practices into the visual art world, it also gobbled up other practices like experimental filmmaking or even activism. Did Derkon's installment as a director of the Volksbühne indicate that now also the performing arts theater would be incorporated by and into the empire of visual arts? There are some signs for it. In New York currently, there's a, pro a project called The Shed, a gigantic building at the Hudson Piers, which provides a space for a performance-based mixed media art, explaining itself and its future plans by referring to names like Philip Perino, Olafur Eliasson, Pierre Wieck, Liam Gillick, Tino Segal, Rick Retiravanija, Doug Aitken, and others. Derkon, who will receive a considerably bigger budget by the Berlin government than Kastorf, will also receive a huge additional space of that kind at the former Tempelhof airport. Could this be seen as the first sign of such a development now in Berlin, for the first time A in Europe and B in a cultural world that so far was not dominated by private but by public investments, with now the public spenders 
behaving like private spenders. But I did not want to go into this so much, this possible future, as into the rhetorics and intellectual, if not ideological investments of both the defenders of the old status quo of the Volksbühne, blaming Derkon to be an exponent of neoliberal cultural politics, and those who on the other side accuse the Volksbühne fans as provincial and even nationalist bunch who defend their youth culture grown old against a new, more international Berlin. A key question of that debate was indeed the question of language. The old Volksbühne was, as I described earlier, the voice and the stable architecture to a youth culture that preferred instrumental music without a voice, which enabled an international following and with a permanently changing architecture, but with one permanent feature, the signature of a rich and mostly troubled history. The Volksbühne provided this, all by, their, this by all their new formats and by generating the youngest clientele a theater ever had in Germany. But it was voice-based and language-based, and the language was German. The price for the adventure synthesis of ahistorical and historical formats had a price, a national language. But cultural life in Berlin, in the meantime, has become more and more international. This development has started already in the 90s, but this was still a mainly European internationalization, and it was composed to a large degree from people from neighboring countries, including many East Europeans, whose first foreign language then was more often not English. Also, people who had grown up in East Germany had learned Russian instead of English. By 2000, the percentage of Americans, both South and North, has risen considerably. Also, more Southern Europeans arrived. And I'm still talking mainly about cultural migration and tourism, not about mass migration and refugees. Beginning with the United Nations Plava project around 2006, 2007, an extension of the unrealized Nicosia Manifesta, organized by Anton Vidocle and others, Berlin cultural life, especially around the visual arts, became English language based. At first, it seemed discourse was not so crucial within an internationality which was primordially visually defined. But the new English-based art discourse conquered more and more territories. Accordingly, the focus of discourse shifted from European and German issues, especially those of so-called reunification or the Blair-Schröder-driven neoliberalization of social democracy, or the new racism, especially in the former East, and other themes of the 90s, to more global issues, especially those of post-colonial discourse, and towards an anti-racism which was more organized along the lines of colonial histories than along the lines of German and European anti-racism. Also, anti-anti-Semitism and anti-racism now often seem to compete for attention in discursive hegemony among the cultural left. At the same time, the institutionalization of English-based art discourse made progress. The so-called Bologna process in the universities, with its simultaneous deregulation and overregulation of higher education, including art and art theory, had led to more and more master and PhD programs, which were too specific and too small to function within the context of just one country and its language. So also universities and academies were catering to a diverse language audience, and this could only be done in English. When Derkon was nominated to replace Kastov, he announced a departure from language-based theater as the main pillar of the theater. He was not very specific on how to replace this, but it seemed that dance and event-based theatrical productions were to be produced instead. He argued that Berlin has become an international and culturally diverse city and could no longer hide behind the provincialism of an idea of theater which would only be comprehensible to the global minority of German-speaking people. This argument has been taken up by some of the protagonists of the current Berlin scene. 
For example, Bonaventure So Bejeng Dikung, director of Savvy Contemporary, a type of Kunstverein that's very successful in picking up post-colonial issues, or artist Hito Steyer, have spoken in support of Dergan and against the white provincialism of German theater. They thought of the Volksbühne and its cultural context as white, male, and outdated. Derkon himself, obviously deeply disturbed by the controversy around him, picked up this thread and also complained about the nationalism of the Volksbühne supporters. How did they argue and what did the other side say? When Derkon was what appointed, it was above all the leading directors and artists of the institutions who attacked him although he had initially offered to include them. Bert Neumann, who tragically died a few months after the decision was made, the signature stage designer of the house, he just called him the curator and refused every further conversation. This label just stuck. Curator became a dirty word for kind of art world imperialism. René Polish, star director, leaked that Derkon had promised him Quote, I will make you world famous. As a response, Polish declined the collaboration, and a T-shirt with their sentence, I will make you world famous, was sold at the Volksbühne shop. The line of critique followed primarily the well-known tra trajectory of the critique of gentrification and the tourism industry, which is accused of having taken over Berlin. The non-German speakers are in this critique dismissed as tourists, the motivation for Durkin's nomination is understood as an attempt to please this fastest growing, and by the way, only larger growing business branch that the city has. Durkin was seen in conjunction with Airbnb commercial commercialization, ruining the rents and driving out the original tenants from the neighborhood. As understandable and as supportable as the critique of gentrification and of the city's failure to keep rents low, in this discourse, sometimes it borders with xenophobic components. A more detailed and argumentative text was published by Guillaume Paoli, a philosopher from, from Berlin, who 10 years earlier was an activist for the unemployed and founder of the movement of the so-called happily unemployed. He arguing then against the work ethic in general and for a kind of bohemian activism against forced employment and the new social laws that got into effect uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s. He wrote against the internationalization of the theater, not by arguing for the local or the national, but by lauding the Volksbühne as a result of a certain historical development, not so different from my line of argument in the beginning. The emancipation by and through placelessness and timelessness of the early 90s got a voice and a place there. Of course, one could still say this needs a new correction, a new intervention. It has become too predictable. But then this should be conceived as a self-correction, not by an external intervention from the state. But Paoli also wrote something else. He argued polemically that event and touring productions oriented Volksbühne would at best cater to a pity bourgeois scene of students who discuss, quote, critical whiteness, queer studies, and accelerationism, unquote. This aggressive distinction of a genuine place from a place in which queer culture and the latest debates about anti-racism would flourish reminds one today of those recent accusations after the triumph of Trump. The intellectual left has debated far too long over transgender toilets while the real, work, real working class has become right-wing. But of course, only a white working class has voted for Trump. And the disassociation of blacks and queers from the working class is highly problematic, to say the least. As is the distinction between intellectual fashion and real, authentic, deeply rooted intellectuals. When the wave of protest against the Durkheim decision reached new altitudes, all of a sudden a letter to the public appeared, signed by plenty of intellectual supporters of Durkheim, from the culture business, many of them indeed that kind of mega curators which the Berlin Bohemia was afraid of, but among them were also many of the 
countries and internationally important representatives of a post-colonial discourse, among them Ukwui Enveso and Mancia Diawara. Their support seemed to underline that the anti darkon spirit was narrow-minded Western and Eurocentric, if not altogether racist. A counterposition articulated at the same time that it was the Volksbühne who always had decidedly gay themes, the Schlingensief, a director who would work with post-colonial themes early on, and that it had, different from the highbrow festival theater that people expect from Dirkon, toured the very poor districts from Berlin constantly. But above all, Dirkon's English would be for the newly arrived refugees even more difficult to understand than the German of the Volksbühne. My personal position to the war around the Volksbühne is not so important because I want to finally end with a problem. But here I will briefly sketch it. The main importance of the Volksbühne is that it had collectively developed an aesthetic paradigm which aesthetically captured historical and cultural processes of the last 25 years. This is a point for its preservation as well as a call for change. But this change can only be produced from inside of the milieu, but also, of course, acknowledging that this milieu can and should no longer be conceived without the non-German speakers who make up the communities of Berlin and Berlin nightlife today. This is precisely the correction it has to accept. The option for such an internal revolt, a concrete and specific negation of what went wrong, and a strengthening of what was still the most subversive speech around could only come from those who would share the initial political goals, or better, are aware of the historical function of the timelessness and placelessness of these countercultures and their relation to and negotiations with the regular and established culture. It could not be solved only silenced by a coup d'etat from above regardless of what Dirkon will do in reality. But what is more important is that a cultural front has been installed during this debate, which is similar to a lot of fronts and antagonisms in the world today in general. The emancipatory, queer, feminist and anti-racist left is described by a kind of local socialist position as neoliberal, and thus pro-capitalist, and the localist socialist position of, let's say, someone who fights against gentrification is described as nationalist or even national socialist by a critical anti-racist author. Now we have indeed a paradoxically global development towards and there is unfortunately no better word, national socialist positions. And as always with such positions in support of capital. But it is a perversion on the level of discourse that an emancipatory left lets itself dictate the conditions of discourse by this mechanism and by this movement. In the German debate there was recently a comment by writer Ivo Bosic who in order to clarify positions, came up with a working definition of left and right, which I find quite helpful, uh, also in a normative sense. Left equals free society plus unfree economy. Right equals unfree society plus free economy. Hence, socialism would be located in the first definition, but now combined with and not set against LGBT rights, anti-racism, and feminism. Neoliberalism would be in the second definition, together with new, evangel new evangelical or Islamist or other new fundamentalist religious positions, anti-feminism, anti-abortion, homophobia. This what is something that we already have in the rise in several countries, Uh, in Europe, Eastern Europe, China, and in places, of course, like Saudi Arabia. But there's also a danger that we get this also in other parts of Europe, in Brazil, other parts of South America, and, of course, the U.S. 
It is, 25 years later, a weird and twisted repetition of the old reconciliation between East and West after the fall of the wall, as a farce, if you wish. The interesting and disturbing aspect of this development is that although nobody in this cultural war around the Volksbühne is taking far-right positions, but even the cultural surroundings as the one in which this discussion about the theater in Berlin takes place, the same discursive dynamics seem to be unavoidable. Everybody seems to be eager to learn the geography of these conditions by accepting assumptions that you are either nationalist or neoliberal by picking up one of the two positions. Indeed, both sides are, in the cultural world, till this day claiming rather leftist goals, though of different kind. But by accepting the new territorial takeover by the definitions coming from writer's rhetoric, they start to believe that their antagonist is behind his or her leftist mask precisely the political antagonist they fear, either a neoliberalist or a populist, reactionary nationalist, not keeping in mind that these two are precisely the same thing. The free economy produces an unfree society, and only there where this economy is overwhelmingly based on the production of cultural commodities it accepts some basic liberties of free speech and expression. But if, as is the case mostly, especially in the current global dynamics, economic neoliberalism and cultural neo-authoritarianism add up to the same thing, then the position on the other side should also urgently begin to understand and behave as they are part of the, two th of the same thing. Two facets of the left, civil right, emancipation, and socialist economic politics, and start negotiating their positions on their terms, not by accepting a terminology and a discursive landscape which is based on false alternatives. And if Chris Darkon should be a symptom of these negotiations under the current pressure, or become one, then he can be welcomed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for this brilliant and inspiring talk because it brought forth so many uh, important and controversial issues. Um, and uh, I think there will be quite a number of questions, but until I open the floor uh, for the debate and discussion, um, I would ask you um, uh, just a couple of couple of questions and make a couple of uh, comments. Um, well, um, first of all, um, this split between the theater as institute and theatricality as institute and imperialism and globalism of art, which it was at stake always, but these two institutes never clashed until, you know, this more global and more meta politics clashed with each other and theater and arts clash became the symptom of this clash between global and local. Um, but, you know, um, uh, in your talk, we see that uh, you are more or less backing and supporting uh, another kind of development and resistance that would come uh, f from the context itself, from the theater's context itself, rather than would be imposed on it from above, right? So mm -hmm. this, is, this is the type of development or um, resisting element that you would support uh, that would not be um, brought from some kind of uh, transnational, uh, trans speculative government uh, of, of, of art as institute. On the other hand, what I would like to em emphasize, since we, uh, judging by your talk, are backing up with this important tradition of socialist theater, I mean, uh, this um, perseverance of theater itself in, in its contemporary uh, breakthroughs and contemporary development to stop to be this local 
and uh, local spectacle to, to be this rigid presentation and pretend that there has never been any watershed between uh, performance in contemporary art and performance practice which theatre always represented. And you know, there is this very strange contradiction that people from theatre, even here in Russia, directors, uh, representatives of uh, curatorial teams. We had Marina um, Davidova here, who was the curator of Wiener Festspiele this uh, year. Uh, we had Florian Malzacher speaking a few months ago here. Um, so exactly people from theatre claim that let's not have this watershed between art and theatre. We are also art. Why? Because art is so contemporary, it is so advanced that even theatre representatives don't want to be belonging <laughs> to this. Yeah, don't want to lag behind. And then uh, Matthias Lilienthal was also saying it and Joanna Varsha was claiming that uh, we have to stop to make this watershed. And if we stop to make this watershed between these two edifices, then why make such a row? What stays art, what stays as curatorial uh, governing or uh, regisseur and directing governing? So this is one, of, one of, of the questions that I would ask you. I think that, that, um, um, I think that theater has um, a similar imperialist, if you wish, uh, function like like art in the in the last 25 years or even longer um, it's it's the um, the people who have lost the option to work with reproduction based culture like who are selling records or experimental working with experimental film uh, or film in general or, um, or also producing like uh, books, independent newspapers, uh, fanzines, all these things that were based on reproduction and that have disappeared as sources of income in the digital world, they, they do, did not only escape to the art world, which a lot of them did, they also escaped to the world of theatre, depending, um, depending on their abilities or uh, talents or whatever. And uh, when I say the world of theatre, um, I mean, since you've described it as such a that if you described the parallel that also in theater people try to went yeah to other to other forms uh, then i mean that theater had also a business model uh, a stable business model but it was dependent from the state the same way that that the, the visual art world is dependent from the market theater is dependent from the state and this is basically the only strong distinction that one can still make for the two worlds you cannot it's basically, uh, one can say that whenever it's the stability of a cultural production is based on a steady income, even a contract, um, um, yeah, uh, this is, this is um, the theater world, and the money comes not exclusively, but it comes mainly from the state, a little bit from entrance fees and the audience who pays. Uh, and, and wherever you have um, gallerists, um, collectors, people who are speculating with their money, who, who put their money into also art production funds and things like this, uh, this is the world of the visual art. But in both worlds, certain projects are possible that are complete, look completely identical and uh, have ex absolutely the same aesthetic values. And of course, there is exchange between them. I still would argue that um, there is also an, a strong aesthetic difference in these two worlds, which is not so much based on like a simple uh, base superstructure effect or simple materialist effect that, that you always see what kind of money you earn when you produce art, but it has to do with the, with the way people organize themselves under these different uh, material backgrounds and the way they organize themselves produces a certain discourse and a certain discourse and so on. And for this, for this debate that we're talking about tonight and this, this, um, also the clash of language-based local and, uh, and image-based global, I think that um, there are always uh, 
so to say, meta-local situations in which this confrontation or this, or also this, this reconciliation or this opening up can be very productive in, 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 in relation to certain aesthetic projects. But in general, it's very difficult to overcome this, um, this, this, this general uh, barrier of uh, two economically based different life forms. And um, in, in those countries where there is no such thing as a state theater, uh, performance-oriented arts have been completely swallowed by the visual arts. And in those countries where um, there is a strong tradition of um, um, state-funded uh, theater, uh, there has been very little transgression into, into the theater world, uh, um, into the art world. And theater has, has remained relatively stable and re even had an influx from people coming from rock music, for example, who are now uh, working as directors. There are plenty of those nowadays. Thank you. A very important division that you made uh, in terms of meta-economy, theater as state, art as market. And uh, by the way, in his uh, Rhapsodie pour le théâtre, Badiou writes that the, the main genealogy of theater is state and also the reference is state. So if we want to reconstruct the state, we have to again reconstruct what is theater. Uh, but I would claim that another uh, economic or, or meta-economic context uh, for art would be theory. This is something that had ever been missing in theater, and I think that uh, the globality of theory and some kind of um, meta-language, so not only English is the meta-language, but theory is the meta-language that English is residing in, and also theory is becoming this haute couture of, um, of the contemporaneity, which theater had never uh, obtained and now it, it really wants to get it because theory brings us to critical thought and to bringing us to critical thought it brings uh, closer to politics and that's why theater has to dispense with its you know spectacular fictitious fictionality uh, to get closer to theater, to get closer to parliamentary uh, procedures, etc. And this was the point of Florian Malzacher saying that um, um, uh, contemporary theater, which has nothing to do with, with fictitious text, like the prompted text that theater always um, is depending on, is coming to some kind of self-organized parliament self-organized agora, agon, uh, etc. But uh, in, in this performance generality, it's some kind of performance art, which is different from performance of contemporary art, because contemporary art is theoretically very intense, but it re returns back to institute, returns back to this uh, self-sufficient uh, exhibiting um, a hermetic space, whereas theater as performance act, conceptual performance act, or uh, political democratic performance act can still be open in terms of uh, like constructing uh, political uh, situations. And this was the debate, and, and, and he mm, claimed it as this new situation of new political theater as kind of open space of performance art, which is neither theater as it used to be, like Volksbühne type theater, nor contemporary art space as curated exhibition space. So. So we see here the, the, the conflict, which, which uh, like fight, which will be more contemporary, which will be more politically, which will acquire more political agency. And a theater like Volksbühne is um, uh, very much important, but you made a very important observation that it became by one stroke a history. Um, yeah. But I think the important aspect of Volksbühne, to start at the end, the important aspect is that it, um, it, um, it really kept or it took in what was learned historically before it had its great moments uh, from um, highly 
anti-institutional or extra-institutional subcultures. Whereas uh, what um, uh, Florian Malzer is talking about today on what was happening strongly today is this kind of, uh, um, I would call it neo-interventionist um, uh, theater, which um, is also strongly connected to not so much theory, I would say, but to um, a digital but also conventional uh, visual culture that is witness to all these things uh, and, um, and reproduces their theatrical effects uh, that have sometimes kind of very liberating and, and, and uh, uh, progressive effects, but, but they're always in a uh, they, they can only work in connection with um, a certain uh, public life of moving images, which is be it YouTube or local TV channels. And, uh, and this is, I would say, not so much reflected in, in a lot of the works because they, they seem to take too seriously the, 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 the kind of existentialist aspect of theater that you are there really with your body and so on. Uh, whereas the, the visual art people, they, they have all their assistance and they are not present and so on. Um, this one thing, the other thing, something about the, 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 what I also strongly agree with the way theory has become an international language. The way theory enters the art world, I think, more than through the subjectivities of artists who are referring to theory and to art objects that are somehow dependent on theoretical ideas, is the way it made its way into um, the art bookstores. Uh, as the prime place of selling theory and, uh, and the development of a completely new genre of theoretical texts, which are little pamphlets of 50 pages, uh, in the big early days still extracted from some bigger work, but now all these well-known, world-famous philosophers and theoreticians, they write these things. They write these 50 pages things, they, they write one of them per month, and there are all these publishers who who produce them, and they are the thing that you buy if you go into a museum. They are very cheap, and, and they, they have they have yeah they have high they have high editions. This is this is really a, again a business idea, and it is con this is strongly connected um, with the museum shop. Uh, it wouldn't exist without the museum shop, uh, and um, it, it is, 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 is it, this is these are like second and third careers of um, certain thoughts and certain people, and they are closely connected, I would also say, with a certain version of self-help books. Uh, they have this component of self-help in them, a kind of self-help which is not so far away from this kind of inclusion through participation or something like that. It's something that you, that you buy for little money after you've seen some kind of erratic show or... Uh, and it also kind of reinforces your your being on the side with progressive forces and so on. I think this is this is I mean the the, the marriage between theory and, and and certain forms of visual art goes on for a long time now. But this I think is a really new stage. Um, the floor is open, I think, for questions, comments, and we would welcome you to ask them. Пожалуйста. Если у вас есть какие-то комментарии или вопросы, пожалуйста. Uh, I have a question concerning the importance of uh, this affair of Fox Bühne project of of upgrading in uh, kind of I'm, I don't know the details. Sorry, I've heard just a bit about the situation. Uh, is it a prospect of uh, upgrading Fox Bühne to the standards of the world, uh, uh, new art, uh, economy, logistics, how do you define it itself? And uh, second question, why exactly Volksbühne? And no, not Schaubühne, not Hebel Lamufer, uh, not Berliner Ensemble. Yeah. Thank you. I think, to, to again, start with the second part of the question, uh, I think it's precisely because of the uh, highly um, Important historical function it had uh, that these other theaters don't have. These other theaters, I mean, Hebel am Ufer is a different thing. I mean, for all of those who, who do not know all these Berlin theaters, but, but it's Hebel am Ufer is something that 
came out of the, of the Volksbühne. So those whole ideas of delimitation of theater that were experimental events like three-day discussions and so on that were the trademark of the Volksbühne had been continued at the Hebel am Ufer also personally by the same people. But so, but it is kind of smaller and, and, and uh, has a smaller budgets and so on. The Volksbühne is, is, has the historical function and it is kind of seen in general as uh, the thermo, the, 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 uh, the index for how, how the where, where, where we are historically. And whereas the other theaters that you mentioned are like conventional theaters and of course within the world of the conventional theater there are also developments and there are also changes and there are also fashions but it stays within all these elements of conventional theater like a break after one hour and 15 minutes, a glass of champagne in the break, uh, a return to your seat, uh, um, a, a little light dinner afterwards and, 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 and the same kind of audience. Well, this all was different in the Volksbühne. Uh, I mean, it was also sometimes close to this. These things happened too, but it was, like I said, in a completely different um, uh, cultural historical function. So I think to, to uh, completely refashion it or remodel it, rebuild it, is because of its importance. Um, and, uh, and because it because it is about the part of the audience that is supposed to be the new part of the audience, the one in which you can, that, that can be read as trendy, avant-garde, the tendency as, instead of, as opposed to, to normality. And uh, if you would have remodeled the Schaubühne, there probably would also have been an outrage, but everybody would say, yeah, let these, let these people scream, who gives a shit? Uh, Culturally, politically, we don't care. Um, what this is really, um, this is really an, an, an ambitious attempt to kind of make a statement, uh, also kind of in a struggle of cultural hegemony in a city. Basically, it's you could you could also reduce the struggle to the Green Party versus the Left Party. Um, but now both are in the new government and both have to come to a decision what to do with the Volksbühne. The first part of your question, I think, I think um, um, they don't really know what they're, what they're trying to do. And, and whether this is in, in relation to um, um, some kind of global development like as exemplified by the Shed or this, um, um, this event that was once happened in, in Venice where all kinds of major artists produced operas, uh, Il Positano, I don't forgot what this was called. Uh, uh, this, is, um, this is possible, uh, but I don't know. I mean, um, or nobody knows, probably, except maybe for Chris Dacon and some other people. Um, but it is also completely unclear whether this is really kind of a major, will be kind of major cultural factor. I think the, the only thing that we know is that it is staged as a debate between uh, local German language theater uh, and, and uh, international art. And, um, and that, this is, that this distinction and this conflict is brought into a place that is notorious for being advanced, for being um, a measure of what's going on right now. And that, I think, is a strategic element in it. How that turns out to become artistic reality, I don't know. I wanted to ask, uh, what do you think? If there is a way to preserve this uh, fun and uh, this like endless night, eternal night, and uh, if we say in German, like Schemann's Laws Fun, um, in the situation of the irreversible, uh, getting back to normality and to ordinary life, I mean, in Berlin. I think the, 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 the endless night has become, uh, this, is, this sounds a little bit like, a, <laughs> like an old cultural pessimist, but 
the endless night is a commodity that is very well sold. And it, it has, I mean, the endless night has probably uh, uh, financed EasyJet. And um, without the endless night, EasyJet would probably not fly 10 times a day to Berlin Schönefeld. Um, so um, that is one side. And, and this commodity is here and there in a very good shape. I mean, it, you still get what you want uh, from it, and, and you get a lot of people um, with who you can celebrate this endless night that are very good at it, and it's great fun, and it goes on really forever, and you can still have all this, uh, but, the, but it will not, um, it is no longer uh, changing, or at least you don't, will not get the feeling that it changes the course of the world, and, or that what you're doing is a major um, negation of the way you're supposed to li live, or, or something like that. That's, that's the difference, but, but I would even say that the quality of all of this, the quality of the sound, the quality of the DJs, uh, the quality of the spaces, the, the looks of the people, this is all much better than it was 20 years ago. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real great commodity, but it's a commodity. I'm not asking a question, but I want to remind that in uh, visual art, Theater, theatrality, theatricality is a bad word that goes back to Michael Fried when he criticized the minimalism for theatricality. And I want to remind why in visual art the theatricality is a bad word. Because in the theater, Everything that we are seeing in the theater is not what existed reality. And visual art works with what, what is authentic, what is real. It is clear that we may argue further, at least in the visual art, the wish to leave the illusionism is, a very, is an imperative, abandoning illusionism. And my question is connected to... Uh, I have to say that uh, in Russia, for example, we have a very clear cut di distinction uh, between the theater milieu, even between the theater infrastructure, large theater infrastructure, and the visual art. If we discuss visual art, contemporary visual art, it is in a radical opposition, cultural opposition in the contemporary Russian society. And the theater is integrated, integrated in the establishment, political establishment. Actors, famous actors, are representatives of the establishment. So this is a, a merger. There's no difference. So what, I, what is my conclusion? Do you think that there are genres or types of art which are, which are long, so corrupted? That, that these types of art cannot be worked with. They are, these types of art are, you know, are, are kind of like a dustbin, you know. 
you cannot work with them, or you can work with all genres, with all types of art. I think that that um, this modernist idea um, that the illusion is bad and um, the authentic object saves us from from illusion uh, has had a parallel in theater as well. Uh, in, in, in the art world, or in Michael Fried's discourse, it was called theatricality. And in theater, you had, you had uh, it was the invention of performance art. Uh, performance art was the, the reintroduction of an authenticity of the body against, um, against forms of illusion. Um, and so this was like um, um, coming from, from Arto onwards, you have a similar... Um, you have a similar um, um, crisis or a similar diagnosis of crisis and, and attempts to overcome them and attempts to do something against it. So as in... Um, um, and in the cause of this, this conflict between uh, um, modernists and minimalists or modernists and postmodernists in, in, in the visual arts and parallel... Um, conflicts in uh, in theater, the original conflict had been transformed. Uh, it had not been solved. The problem has not been solved, but it has been transformed into other problems. And I agree that it would always be the easiest to solve this problem if you define what you're doing in an art genre in a very specific way, if you're very specific about what a certain genre does and can do the way modernism has done it. But, um, but this is no longer doable, I think. This is, is no longer doable from the, not only from the, um, because history has taken another turn, but because the main anchor of this diagnosis of modernism was that art, art genres would work with certain media. And the media situation has completely changed. No one is working with one specific media. It's not possible the media all contained by larger uh, containers of several media and basically the, by the general state of affairs of digitality. So I think we still have this problem. This is transformed to different forms. And we are in a situation where um, more and more art forms will uh, become connected or mixed or mingling and this will um, this will will be the challenge to redefine this problem um, under these conditions under the conditions of digitality so to say or not so much digitality as some kind of metaphysical zeros and ones uh, horizon but before the um, the current product tools that digitality um, produces, and I mean the the fact that you uh, the, the, just one smaller remark on the side that um, I think when you are saying that in Russia uh, contemporary art are like against the state, whereas um, theater is is pro state. Um, this I think is is always a question of how strong the market is. Uh, I agree that theater is highly connected to the state, and there is always this kind of off theater that tries to run away from that. And there's, on the other hand, art that is more or less connected with the market. And when the art is running away from the market, it often ends in the theater. Uh, and then for the artist who has run away from the art market to the theater, it's not so much the repressive state that he or she finds there, but for, at first, an exile from the market. And the other way around. I think very important uh, comment was raised by um, Anatoly and, uh, well, the answer is also um, uh, quite important in terms of, like, um, um, escape into theatre as the resistance to market, which is the case for many Western, Western European and, and German contexts. 
uh, because theatre be becomes rather resistance to market and uh, some kind of um, hyper-speculative economy uh, rather than some kind of um, uh, solidarity with the state uh, or, or national values. Whereas in Russia the situation is a little bit different also because the failure of globalization of economy and failure of globalization of its uh, politics and uh, 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 failure of foreign policies as well. So um, the, the condition and the row and the watershed between theater and art here is also the symptom of, of, of this situation of global and national, where global becomes the enemy, the uh, towards which state is hostile, and that's why um, theaters which back up the nationalist uh, policy back up the state, uh, and uh, globality, which has a bigger uh, distribution, becomes the um, uh, um, how to say mm, uh, the, the the outcast yeah. the, the outcast of the of, of the of the hegemonic policy ha hegemonic cultural policy uh, but but the question is also uh, uh, in terms of um, the question can be put in terms of uh, imperialism of art uh, which posits contemporary art as the only art I mean the problem is not only uh, how to deal with this uh, difference between theater or art or which is more contemporary, which is more advanced, but that there is only one art. This is the imperialism of art. There is no other art. There can be only one uh, institute, which is art, which is contemporary art. And um, uh, I think uh, uh, such a strong movement and migration of theater practices towards performance and the statement of Erika Fischer-Lichter, which she makes in her book, uh, Performance as Transformation, where he also tries to refer to contemporary art performance as some kind of specimen and example for theater, um, uh, is the symptom of uh, theater being tired of its own fictitious, illusionary narrative, but um, uh, there is a converse crisis in art, which is uh, in its own term totally tired of its uh, conceptual rigidity. Uh, so we um, face here uh, some kind of import-export uh, between these uh, two genres, uh, when art claims for some kind of narrative, and you know, Anatoly, that there has been lots of curators which were uh, summoning narrative back into contemporary art. On the other hand, uh, theater uh, curators like Marina um, Davidova, who spoke here uh, some time ago, uh, being tired of endless narratives of theater, um, um, appealing for the seizure of this narrative and bringing back the emptiness and some kind of blankness into uh, this noise of, uh, of, of theater performance. But um, the, the problem is again in, in, in the, this mutual crisis of this two Gesamtkunstwerk type of uh, art productions, because art is very total, as well as theater has its own history of totalitarianism, uh, when these two totalitarianisms are competing, and uh, the crisis in both of these institutes is to the detriment of these both institutes. So the fact that Derkan, as a curator, agreed to come to theater, it's already the crisis of art and of, of cura curatorship. Uh, whereas, um, this is my opinion, and I think many will not agree with me, uh, what is happening in theater in terms of um, going out into ready-madedness and uh, 
um, uh, real-time performances, etc., which kills the text, kills the score, kills the um, artifice of actor, uh, is also undermining theater. But again, due to this undermining, uh, Derkan has come to occupy theater. So you mean Derkon would, would um, not solve the crisis of theater or the progress of yeah. theater, but he would try to solve the crisis of art and use the theater for that? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Um, yeah, I think um, first one would have to think both have a very, I mean, since I've already reduced them to business models, one can also even reduce them further and, uh, and say, um, a very abstract ground of, of, uh, of uh, that is also a problem and a, yeah, and, and a, and a possibility for both. Is they, they both talk about individuality and rarity, um, but have the problem that, that what is individual and what is rare uh, is both not rare. Uh, so there are, each art object is supposed to be an original, but there are so many of those originals that they are uh, still ontologically singular, but um, all these singularities um, are, their, their, their distinction, their differences are, tend to be, to, to, to nil. Um, the same is with, in, in, in the, the main, I think the main, Thing that theater has to offer is not narratives or stories or fictions, but indeed bodies. No? And this is the same. I mean, bodies are so um, totally unique and special and specific and mortal, but there are so many of them. And, uh, and I think the, the, the problem is um, you, in the logic of market, brings this form of abstraction. Normally you wouldn't do that because uh, this is all bound to certain stagings, framings, and only only because they are organized within a market like, and even there where there's not the market but the state or other organizations, um, competition, uh, this this kind of abstractions arise and uh, uh, and produce certain certain crises um, and reach the organizational forms and then something happens like this kind of um, yeah like desperate attempts to fundamentally solve the problems that cannot be solved fundamentally but one thing I wanted to say also is that I think that the um, the this kind of um, real theater that you were speaking about this kind of uh, theater that gets rid of the actor, rid of the text, and, and does something in the real world, uh, also resembles a lot the, um, the logic of uh, contemporary cultural industry, uh, the TV uh, reality show, and it, it has a lot to do with that. Um, and I thought it was more interesting if when this approach also was kind of went back to the theater inside. Yeah, yeah. So when René Polish uh, um, was starting uh, this principle that he's basically still using um, to have nameless characters, four or five, uh, speaking, they were, not, they were not roles, or, but they were, um, in, they were incorporating theory, they were, they were, they were, they were talking theoretical text, they were speaking theoretical text as if they would desperately mean them, kind of a grotesque uh, um, version of theory, but exactly the way you were describing earlier how, how theory is, is um, used these days. That was for me an example of that you, that you completely left theater but, and, and, and completely go outside of it, of all of its functions, but then bring this back to the theater. Uh, any other comments or questions, please? I would like to make two clarifications and ask a question. Am I right 
that speculative economy and authenticity, originality, go hand in hand. Maybe I didn't understand you correctly, but I had in, I, I think you, you said such a thing. And second, you said that talking about left-right divide, the left is free society and unfree economy, and the right are unfree society and free economy. But you said that the discussions between people influenced by nationalism or abstract internationalism are two sides of one medal and the discussion, the debate is not essential. It's not about the essence. You mentioned that there are cases when that when unfree economy and unfree society may be combined. You mentioned cases like Turkey, when there is a country open to foreign investment, but with traditionalism, Islamization and market go hand in hand. And another question, and the question, you said that in 1990s, Berlin uh, is theoretically, uh, there is a new theory in Berlin, simultaneously, the post-colonial discourse comes and the Bologna process. And I have a question. May we, may, may you could you comment upon this process uh, in the post-colonial theory uh, discourse, uh, the cultural imperialism uh, against the old culture of Berlin? Um, the first question about um, the relation between um, the original and um, and the market. Um, Yes, not so much to the authentic, because that's mostly referring to people. Uh, but you can say, of course, that, uh, that, uh, that the work is authentic if, it, if it's really what it claims to be. Um, um, yes, that's, that's the, that's the um, precondition for, um, for an art market, that it, that it deals with, um, um, with originals. And that's the business model that is also has been extended to all kinds of things that normally wouldn't even have an original. For example, digital video, uh, where you have, uh, have you have to do a lot of uh, many things in order to define them as as originals. Um, secondly, about the question of the relation between uh, the situation in Turkey, I think this is this was, would be my point if I understood you correctly. My point would be that. And um, that a free economy, as long, uh, and, and I mean with, with, by free, uh, an uncontrolled economy, an economy that is, that is kind of less regulated or little regulated, um, cannot deal with its contra the contradiction it produces, the inequalities it produces, in the long run differently than by producing an unfree society and all kinds of uh, and it's it's from the perspective of the of the economy always better when this, when there's some authoritarianism uh, takes over or some fundamentalist ideology um, then um, political struggle or class struggle or something like that uh, so that would be a case in point uh, and and the exception would be I think uh, those kind of so-called uh, cultural economies, where, where like, there's a real huge cultural sector, the, the, the size of the cultural sector, if you define cultural in a larger sense, uh, uh, makes a difference, I think. Um, because you cannot like sell cultural diversity um, in the long run uh, in, 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 to, without, without diversity. And about the relation between um, the uh, post-colonial discourse and um, and the Bologna process, or the the, the, um, the, the arrival of post-colonial discourse um, in um, um, in the 90s and zeros, uh, basically mainly in the mainly in the zeros, I would say, um, the the Bologna process had this kind of 
again, paradoxical uh, re result that it uh, made possible to uh, um, invent and develop all kinds of new subject matters and disciplines. Um, but these disciplines were, um, uh, in order to make them attractive, they had to be very specific. And that again made the, because the Bologna process is also one of commercialization, uh, in order to be able to sell these highly specific things, they had to be, uh, they had to use um, very general or, or uh, yeah, nivellate, uh, leveled uh, language, which would then be English, so that, that people from all kinds of, from all over could, basically the same model as the internet uses. No, you, you, have, you can be very specific, uh, because you reach everyone, everywhere. And so you can come with a very specific theme, uh, but you know that people from Singapore to Johannesburg will be uh, online, so... And that is exactly the, the way this functions. And so I think the post-colonial discourse did not really arrive in the university as a whole to challenge the existing Western hegemony, but it arrived in all these kind of little specialty um, disciplines and but there were of course more people around that were interested in, in post-colonial discourse especially in the cultural segment so that it arrived in culture much stronger than in um, than in the university where it was kind of segmented and, and dispersed I think we shall be wrapping up and uh, I want to thank uh, Diedrich again for this uh, wonderful talk and just um, uh, finalizing <laughs> uh, this debate say that um, not only there is situation when we deplore what happens with Volksbühne but I would say that in this concrete case I would really deplore um, what happens to contemporary art, why? Because uh, one of the most important things uh, in this division between theater and art was the audience, the epistemology and anthropology of the audiences and uh, certain epistemological rupture that happened in art that once it totally nullified itself, it sublated itself, uh, that theatre has never done with itself. Theatre has never sublated itself. And that's why art never needed the audience. So when art goes to theatre, it will inevitably start to entertain audience and to get into this situation where, when it also is enjoying its own performance and making the audience enjoy the performance. So enjoyment and joy, something that was totally absent in contemporary art and which was the part of its, uh, uh, of its uh, modesty and strictness of its discipline. And what we now really see in new movements of a performance in art which never existed. Well, we know that performance is part and parcel of contemporary art, but performance artists uh, wh whatever they did, they never made audience enjoy it and get into this emphatic immersion as the audience in theatre and they would never enjoy what they are doing. What we see now in recent um, tendencies of contemporary art is that people want to sing and dance and enjoy what they do and make the audience get into this emphatic immersion. This is something new. This will be happening more and more, and I'm, 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 I don't like it. Although I don't know if not um, Marina Abramovic and Matthew Barney also really enjoyed what they were doing, but that's another question, <laughs> more psychological. <laughs>